Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, before I get started, uh, two quick things. One, uh, an acknowledgement, not an announcement. Today is my sister's birthday, and I wish her a happy birthday. She is my dear um, What's her name? Elizabeth Carney. Leave a pile of <laughs> I spoke with her this morning, and uh, we are very close. Uh, the second is that some of you have been asking, and I can confirm that the president is having a meeting uh, 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 early this afternoon with uh, Senate Democratic leaders uh, here at the White House to discuss uh, obvious matters. Um, I also can tell you that uh, the Vice President, uh, who is in Moscow, is uh, making some calls, leadership calls uh, as well. Uh, and uh, that's all I have from the announcement on the announcement front, so let's get started. Ben. Thanks, Jay. A couple questions on Libya, please. Can you set expectations for today's uh, principals meeting? Uh, in particular, is this uh, the day when the team is trying to settle on a recommendation for the best intervention strategy to present to the President. Ben, today is a Principals Committee meeting, as you know. Uh, these happen with some regularity, uh, and uh, they are discussing the events in Libya and uh, in the region. Uh, I don't anticipate, uh, in fact, I know this is not a decision meeting. Uh, it uh, is obviously one that will, uh, in which uh, the events that are uh, evolving in Libya will be uh, reviewed and discussed, and the variety of options that we have already taken and are implementing uh, will be discussed, as well as the options that remain on the table. Uh, but uh, I think that I would not, uh, I don't want to raise expectations that this is a meeting that will uh, lead to uh, an imminent concrete decision about some action. A lot of the questions that we have go to a sense of urgency on um, behalf of the administration, and you've uh, talked to us about, from perspective, how fast things are moving. Uh, but I'm curious, the story in Libya seems to be going the wrong way in terms of uh, certainly the hopes of the, of the White House. Uh, Gaddafi seems even more and more entrenched as the day goes on instead of less. I'm wondering if that pattern of events changes the timeline at all here. It, uh, quickens the, the, the need for uh, a decision about how to intervene. Ben, let me take you back a little bit, because I understand your question and I, and, and I understand this sense of urgency that's created by what we've been witnessing uh, occur in Libya. Uh, but let me rem remind you, first of all, what has been done in remarkable time. Uh, we have imposed very strong sa uh, sanctions, including uh, freezing over $30 billion of the Gaddafi regime's assets. Uh, we have coordinated also with the United Nations uh, for additional sanctions with our, with our European partners and uh, through the United Nations. We have uh, led the way in initiating steps uh, through the uh, United Nations to make sure that those members of the Gaddafi regime who are responsible for uh, gross violations of human rights and, and uh, the use of violence against the Libyan people will be held accountable. That includes a UN Security Council referral. Uh, of the Qaddafi regime to the International Criminal Court. Uh, we are uh, engaged in a, a highly uh, swift and coordinated effort to uh, provide hum humanitarian assistance. Um, uh, and uh, we have also, uh, through a variety of channels, reached out to the opposition uh, to discuss um, what, uh, uh, what their goals are and what their situation is. Uh, we have also done uh, uh, military contingency planning. Uh, we have talked about uh, positioning resources in the region uh, for contingencies that might occur uh, of all sorts. And uh, let me remind you that the meetings in NATO this, at NATO this week in Brussels were initiated by the United States of America, by this President. This has all happened in three weeks. Let me take you back to April of 1992, uh, which is when uh, Yugoslav Air Force jets began to bomb civilians in, uh, when essentially when the, the violence began in Bosnia. It took, for an arms embargo, which has already been initiated by the UN against Libya, uh, three months from the declaration of uh, Slovene and Croatian independence uh, for the imposition of an arms embargo. Uh, it took nine days in this case. When the ethnic cleansing began in April of 92 in Bosnia, uh, it took a year, over a year, for an asset freeze. 
over two years for a travel ban. Again, our actions were in under two weeks in this case. Uh, the, uh, there has never been a situation where the international community with leadership by the United States has acted as quickly as it has uh, to respond to this kind of situation. Uh, and uh, this is not the end of it. We are continuing to review options and we are obviously aware of the suffering in Libya and the violence there. But I think it is very important for people to understand uh, the kind of dramatic action that has been taken with the leadership of this president uh, and that will continue to be taken as, uh, as we move forward. Yes. Uh, Jay, if you're saying that a, a decision is not necessarily going to come today, can you give us a, a <coughs> sense of when something like that would come? As you know, Jeff, there have been meetings all week in Brussels at NATO. They continue. Uh, we are in the process of reviewing a variety of options, which I've discussed from here, from uh, Air Force One yesterday, and others obviously have discussed. I don't have a timetable for you for further decisions, or even uh, I don't want to put on the table here that some action will take place at some point in the future. The actions we've taken have been dramatic. And we uh, uh, are implementing them in a way that we hope they will have an effect. <clears throat> we are also, as you know, using uh, the full spectrum of our intelligence resources to ensure that we are monitoring what's happening in Libya and uh, in a way that will enable the international community to hold responsible those members of the regime who are perpetrating uh, violations of human rights. So, this is an ongoing process. The review continues, the options uh, uh, are refined and reviewed uh, and considered, and, and obviously uh, we want to work with our international partners. We feel it's very important uh, to, so that any action we take uh, be done in a coordinated way with our international partners because that is powerful message to the people of Libya, to the Libyan regime, and to the people around the region. This is not about the United States. It is not about Western powers, European powers. It's about the people of the region, and in this case, the people of Libya. Switch topics really quickly um, regarding Secretary Locke. When do you expect to name uh, a successor for him, and do you <coughs> expect that his appointment to be ambassador to China will go relatively rapidly through the Senate? We certainly anticipate that uh, Secretary Locke will be approved by the Senate. He has been approved, uh, obviously, once before for his current post, and he is a, we feel, uh, supremely qualified <coughs> candidate for uh, the ambassadorship. Uh, the process that the President just went through was one to search for a replacement for the ambassador to China. It wasn't one, uh, that was the primary goal, it was not to search for a replacement for whoever filled that role. Uh, so I don't have a timetable for you on uh, naming a, a nominee to succeed uh, Secretary Locke. Yes, Jake. Um, first of all, happy birthday to your sister. <laughs> she thanks you. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> the Republicans on the Hill have seized uh, upon uh, NPR's uh, latest woes. Um, to talk about how it's time for the federal government to stop subsidizing the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, the President's budget proposes more than $400 million for um, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm wondering if you have any response to uh, the recent uh, kerfuffle involving the resignations of both Schillers. Uh, Jake, the, everyone agrees that we need to cut spending. The President put forward a budget that does that in dramatic fashion. Uh, we also, that budget also m contains within it the President's priorities, and, and we're working with Congress to uh, find common ground, as you know, on the broader budget issues. Uh, but we believe that, uh, or rather, we do not support calls to eliminate funding for National Public Radio and the Corporation for Public, public Broadcasting as is evidenced by our budget. Well, we think they're, they're, they are worthwhile and important priorities, as, as our budget makes clear. 
Can you just can you just elaborate a little bit? Why, why are they important priorities? What what do they do that? I mean, Republicans argue. Okay, Republicans argue that the marketplace should support uh, the programs of public radio and and uh, PBS. Why does the administration disagree? I'm sorry. Mark. Why does the administration disagree? You're not exactly offering a full-throated defense of, 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 of that. I'm wondering, can you elaborate? Why, why well, I'm not, wait, wait, I'm not, I don't know what you mean by a full-throated defense. What I'm saying is that our, our budget is clear. You guys could, Mara, would you want to come up here? But the, uh, the budget makes clear the president's priorities, and among them are the, the funding at the level that we stipulate in the budget for uh, National Public Radio and the cor uh, uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I, you know, I don't think people here want to get into the history of uh, public broadcasting and public radio and why uh, successive administrations of both parties have felt that uh, it's worthwhile. But uh, suffice it to say that we do. Jay, uh, two percent. Hold on a second. Let me just move through the line here. Can I, uh, yes. Uh, quick question on the budget uh, as well. Uh, you give the president a meeting with Senate Democratic leaders. You said uh, Vice President Biden had been sort of deputized to lead these talks, and you did note that he was still making phone calls from overseas. But is this a sign the president is going to get more actively involved in these budget talks now that you're moving closer to another potential government shutdown? Well, I Ed, the president's been involved. The White House has been involved. Uh, the vice president, as you know, has been involved. Been involved? We he, he has had in this broader debate about budgets and spending, the President has been engaged since the State of the Union in discussions with members, leaders rather, from both parties. You know he has had uh, said members to the White House. He has had discussions, some of which I have uh, mentioned from here and read out from here. Uh, and uh, the multiple, multiple uh, interactions, conversations, meetings between senior White House officials and uh, congressional officials. So. We are engaged. We don't read out every meeting and phone call. Uh, the meetings and phone calls, or the meeting rather, and the phone calls that I mentioned today are happening. Uh, and we, uh, it's all aimed at the purpose of finding uh, the common ground that we need so that we can fund the government for the rest of the year with substantial spending cuts. Uh, as you know, an important part of this process is occurring today. I believe on Capitol Hill when the Senate votes on two measures, the House H.R. Uh, 1 as it's known, the, the, the House uh, Republican proposal, which uh, uh, will be voted on by the Senate, and then the Senate Democratic proposal which will be voted on, and, and the, the outcome of those votes will, we think, help guide us forward in terms of uh, the search for common ground. And we look forward to that happening and we're, we're, we're working very hard to do what we think is very important, which is reach an agreement that funds the government, substantially reduces spending, continues to pay for the very things, uh, the very priorities that are important to keep the economy growing, to ensure that uh, the economy is continuing to create the kind of jobs that we saw last Friday with uh, the most recent jobs announcement. And it takes us through the end of the fiscal year because it is simply uh, we are too great a country with too large an economy uh, to be in a situation where we are negotiating whether or not the government will remain open every two or three weeks. Real quick follow on uh, Libya and um, uh, no fly zone. Uh, yesterday, Secretary Clinton did an interview with Sky News, and she was stressing that this cannot be a U.S. led uh, situation, it has to be multilateral. And the reporter noted that other countries are involved, and the Arab League has gotten behind this, et cetera. Uh, so the reporter asked, in theory, the U.S. would support a no-fly zone, and the secretary said, quote, well, we are going to support the efforts that are being made. Is that a yes, that the administration supports a no-fly zone? Not that you're going to implement it, but that you support it, but you're just trying to figure out how to make it work? Uh, well, I don't want to uh, refine the Secretary of State's words. What I have said from here and what others have said, and I think she's made clear, is that we're reviewing a variety of options. We are actively considering a no-fly zone. So we're going to support the efforts that are being made, the word support. We're going to support Well, I think we will support, in a coordinated way, the actions of the, our international partners, which 
uh, we have leading up to this point and we will going forward because we are an elemental part of that process. But international partners like Britain and France are suggesting they support a no-fly zone. So well, if they're able to go on record and say they support it, why can't we? Well, first of all, I think there's, there's, uh, you're getting a little ahead of yourself in terms of a process of preparing for potential contingencies, evaluating options, uh, even preparing language, which uh, I think you're referring to, and a decision by the international community, by NATO, by the UN, by the United States, by its international partners to uh, endorse and pursue a specific course of action. Uh, I think there's a difference. And we are working very closely with the British and the French and many, many other countries on this effort. Let me, go to Jay. Uh, Jay, uh, let me follow up on, on Ed's <coughs> question because this morning uh, she went a bit further on uh, the early show. She said, quote, w when asked about all the different options that are on the table, she said, quote, we think it's very important, yeah, I'm one, one upping whatever it is. We think it's very important that there be a UN decision on whatever might be done. So she is basically saying that nothing's going to happen without UN approval, which means Security Council approval. And we already know that China and Russia are likely to veto anything. Isn't that a way of saying? that, that uh, we're satisfied with the status quo right now? Is, and let me, as for, is that administration position? That it has to come from the UN, as she said. It is our strong preference that actions we take uh, are done in concert with our inter international partners. But she said UN, not just international partners. Well, and that means Security Council, and that means Russia and China. It, let me just go back to the to the point. It is our strong preference in, in this situation and, and many others that we act together with our international partners because uh, collectively we are stronger than we are individually in cases like this. It is also obviously the case, again, not referring to this specific action, but it is obviously the case that we always reserve the right to act uh, NATO does, rather, as the United States does, to act, to, to act on its own. But I, I, let me just be careful and say that our strong preference and what we are working for right now is to work with the United Nations and, and, other, and the NATO and, and all our international partners on uh, the variety of considerations that are there, the variety of options that we're reviewing. Can you just answer, though, does the President agree that it's very, quote, it's very important that there be a UN decision on whatever might be done? It is very important that we work together with the United Nations and other international uh, organizations and our she international said, She said that there be a UN decision. It's very important. I'm, I'm not going to... Walking back I, I am not said. walking back what she's saying <coughs> at all. I mean, I, I think I just would refer you to the State Department, but it is very important that we work with the United Nations. Okay, but that's not what she said again. She said there be a UN decision on whatever might well, be. Well, again, we are working with the United Nations. We're working with the British and the French. We're working, we are pursuing that course as we decide collectively what options we may take. Okay. Um, on another topic, as you know, in the past, the President has talked about situations in which the U.S. has a moral obligation to intervene, not just uh, intervention on behalf of U.S. Uh, national interests. Is he looking through that lens at this situation in Libya? Is, does he consider this a situation that could get to the point where the United States has a moral obligation is to intervene? Is that one of the ways he's looking at this? Chip, I would say that the statements and the actions that have been taken by this president in the three weeks since this circumstance began in Libya demonstrate uh, the uh, moral uh, outrage that we feel at the actions taken by the Libyan regime against its people. So clearly there is a moral component to uh, not just the actions of the United States and the President of the United States, but the actions of the entire international community in its swift and coordinated reaction to and response to uh, the uh, despicable behavior of the Libyan regime. Last question. The, is there any chance he would stop by the principals meeting today? And it, I'm just trying to get a sense, is there a vigorous debate going on back there over what to do, or is it more waiting to break it down for you, who's on what side and everything? That would be, would that be great. Okay from here? That would be really great. So you're Everybody's conceding that there are two no, sides. I am not. I am not. <laughs> at least, at least <laughs> <two>. <laughs>
more than two uh, songs. That an audio it was really nice of you to offer that. We are, uh, these meetings, again, let me go back to the, uh, my original answer to the original question. These meetings are uh, held frequently in the Situation Room here at the White House, Principals Committee meetings. I believe there was one uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, uh, you know, they are uh, evaluating the various options and the, uh, the situation in Libya and the broader region and, and, and the various options uh, that we have taken and are implementing and others that remain on the table. Uh, I don't have any uh, information on the possibility the President will, will uh, stop by. It's, it's uh, not anticipated. Uh, Ambassador Rice told Good Morning America today that U.S. will keep up the pressure uh, on Gaddafi until he falls. Is this the regime change the President is so often skeptical of? Mm -hmm. Well, we've made clear, Wendell, that we believe the President has said very forcefully that Muammar Gaddafi needs to leave, needs to step down. He has lost the legitimacy to rule in the eyes of his people and in the eyes of the world. I don't think you can be any clearer than that. Senators uh, Kay Bailey Hutchinson and, and Mary Landrieu uh, <coughs> want the President uh, to extend the leases uh, that were basically frozen after the Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico instead of reviewing them. Uh, as, as I understand, all of the leases are being reviewed now individually. Uh, given the uh, uh, increases recently in the price of oil, is this something the President could uh, support? Uh, since the oil spill in the Gulf, terrible, terrible oil spill in the Gulf, the worst in history. Uh, we have ensured that uh, future uh, permits uh, will be granted when there is a containment, when there is a, an, a uh, the applicant shows an ability to handle through a containment procedure the spill. We have, as you know, last month, late last month, last week, uh, granted our first uh, permit for uh, deep water drilling. Since the oil spill, we have granted 37 permits, shallow water permits. Moreover, it's important to note, and I don't think many people realize this, that domestic oil production last year rose to its highest level since 2003. This administration has actively pursued all forms of uh, energy production precisely because we think it's so important to uh, reduce our dependency on foreign oil and to create the <coughs> clean energy industries that will drive uh, economic growth and job creation and our national security through a reduction in foreign oil dependence in the future. So uh, I think that's my answer. Having the SPRO still be <coughs> considered? Uh, I don't have anything new on that. We are monitoring the situation with uh, oil prices. We uh, are confident that the global system has the capacity to deal with the major disruption. We understand uh, the impact that higher gasoline prices have on family budgets, but I have nothing specifically to add except that uh, that option is, uh, is one we're considering, which we said before. Let me One just more question. Okay, let's the Wisconsin uh, involved, State yeah. Senate Majority Leader uh, says the President's political team in Chicago is working to recall uh, Wisconsin uh, State Republican legislators. Any truth to that? I have, I have no idea what you're talking about, Wendell, honestly. Yes. I just uh, I want to try one more time with Jake's line of questioning on NPR. With the proliferation of media from all points of the political spectrum and all points of opinion, why is it important for the taxpayer to still continue to fund public broadcasts? Uh, again, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I, I've made clear what our <coughs> position is on this. I don't want to get into a debate about the merits of public broadcasting. I'm not trying to engage in a debate. But, I'm but, asking but, but the reality is that, that administrations, both Republican and Democratic, have supported uh, public broadcasting in the past, and, and, and we think in, a, in, a, in an era uh, where tough choices have to be made, including the ones that this president laid out. Uh, in his proposed 2012 budget, that there uh, remains uh, 
a need to 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 support public broadcasting and, and NPR. I, I, I don't have anything more on it. For okay. You. Tomorrow, uh, Representative Peter King will have a hearing, obviously very controversial. Obviously, the Deputy National Security Advisor spoke on this over the weekend, Sunday. Is it, does the White House object to the tone and the comments coming from Congressman King, or do you object to the fact that this hearing is being held at all? Or what do you object to about this hearing specifically? Well, I think I have to take issue with your premise. Uh, we have you said, well, we have said that we welcome congressional involvement in this issue. We think it's an important issue. Uh, the Deputy National Security Advisor, Dennis McDonough, spoke about our position on uh, this issue and the, uh, the violent extremism uh, here in, in the United States and uh, made points uh, that, that we think are very important, which is in, in the United States, uh, we do not practice guilt by association. A. B, uh, we believe that Muslim Americans are part of the solution. They are not the problem. It is through the, the uh, helpful cooperation of Muslim Americans that we are able to uh, effectively address this issue. And finally, the, the meeting with Democratic <coughs> leaders today, uh, Joe Manchin, Diane Feinstein have been critical of the what they describe as a lack of presidential involvement. Was this meeting called in response to that criticism? No. It's been scheduled for, for days, and, and as you know, the President meets fairly regularly with the uh, leaders of Congress. Uh, we don't throw on meetings uh, based on comments from individual senators uh, in, in, in 24 hours. And I would just say that the debate that's happening in the Senate and the votes that will come out today in the Senate will, will give us an indication of where we need to go, Congress and the White House, to find the common ground that the American people want us to find uh, so that we can reduce spending, tighten our belts, live within our means, and still fund the essential uh, services of government, our national security, and, and, uh, and, and make the investments that we need to make to continue growing, to, to make sure that the, uh, the kind of growth we've seen in the last year plus and the kind of uh, job creation we've seen in the last year continues. Uh, because there is uh, no plan, no proposal, that will be effective in reducing the deficit or addressing our long-term fiscal issues if we don't grow and create jobs. Yes. Um, two, two, thank you. Two questions one on foreign policy. Does the UN arms embargo restrict um, the United States from sending arms to <coughs> the Libyan rebels in the east? Senator McCain has said that it should be interpreted narrowly to apply only to the government. But what is the administration's interpretation of that? Uh, we believe that the uh, the the arms embargo uh, uh, contains within it the flexibility to allow for a decision uh, to arm the opposition if that decision were made. Second question on the on the budget talks. What what is the president hoping to come out of this meeting today with Democrats? Where, where are you he, headed? He hopes to uh, continue the process of finding the common ground that I've made reference to from here, which is uh, the kind of budget cuts that we can all agree on that the American people expect us to make uh, in a continuing resolution that funds the government through the end of the year. Uh, maintains the investments in the uh, in education and innovation and infrastructure that are essential to economic growth and that uh, uh, does not include extraneous uh, political or social issues that uh, are not the focus of uh, a proper focus of a budget deal. And is Biden, are Biden's calls on specifically about the CR? Uh, I think it's safe to assume yes. Jay, what time is the budget meeting? Uh, it's early this afternoon. It may be uh, within the hour. A minute ago, you used the statement, live within our means. And that's a statement President Obama used yesterday in Boston and is used that often. That is a coincidence. Well, <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm asking is, what does he mean by that? Does that mean a balanced budget? when he says we need a government and a budget that helps us live within our means? Well, as, as, uh, as a technical matter, beyond uh, the, the broadly understood uh, sense of the term, which is that you don't uh, spend more, that you, spend, that, you, that you manage your budget responsibly, your, your inflow and your outflow. And I think as a specific matter, as we talked about in the early days after our budget release, 
uh, our budget uh, is designed to get to a point where we are taking in what we are spending. Now I understand that we have this huge overhang of a national debt that requires substantial interest payments. But you cannot be, be you know, one step in dealing with our fiscal situation, with our deficits and our long-term debt, is to get to a point where we are living within our, within our means, spending only what we're taking in. That's what his budget proposal does, and he thinks it's a very important goal. So it means it's a budget imbalance except for interest on the debt. Mark, if you, uh, and I assume this isn't true, but let's say your uh, credit card bill uh, arrived yesterday and uh, you have a substantial balance and, and an interest uh, payment that you have to deal with. Um, you're never going to get that under control if you go out tomorrow and drop another $1,000 uh, that you uh, haven't earned uh, despite uh, being worth more than that in the work that you do from here. So. The, the point is that it is part of being responsible, financially responsible, fiscal, fiscally responsible, to get to the point where we haven't been for a while, I remind you, in the years prior to getting here. There was a golden era in an administration long, long ago when balanced budgets were created, where surpluses were created, where surpluses were envisioned as far as the eye could see, 1999, 2000. Uh, that's not the circumstance that we inherited when we got here. Uh, it is a circumstance we hope to get to, at least in terms of the uh, balance between inflow and outflow. And we think it's an important uh, uh, milestone. I'm still not clear on what it means. <laughs> I hate to see your checkbook. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Jay. Um, on the budget talks, uh, Kevin McCarthy yesterday. No gift for your assistant. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Kevin McCarthy suggested yesterday that there are talks among House and Senate leaders to extend the, uh, the deadline from March 18th for another two, three, or even four weeks. Is that being circulated here at the White House? What does the President think of that? What I'll tell you is that we think it's important. I think you remember me saying, and probably others, prior to the recent CR that was signed, that, that our desire was to have more time right. to allow for the negotiations that are necessary to reach the common ground uh, that needs to be reached so we can get a final a deal through the end of the year. Uh, that is still our goal. Right. So How we get there, I, I, I'm not going to get into, you know, draw lines in the sand about what we would have, specifically we would support or not support, but we, the, the overall point is important, which is the American people don't want us to get into a situation where we are going through these uh, cycles of negotiations on how to make sure uh, the government's bills are being paid uh, every second Monday or every third Monday. So uh, we need to get very soon to the, to the hard work, the important work, but the achievable work of negotiating a budget deal that funds the government through the end of the year, cuts spending, substantially in a way that all sides can agree on and that uh, maintains the important investments to keep our economy growing. So you're, you're keeping the door open for that then? Yes. Uh, Jay, um, does the President feel that it's premature to broaden the budget talks as some Senate Democrats have suggested to include more than just this tiny slice of the budget that you're focusing on now? He's often said Mara, that's that an excellent question. In the State of the Union, he talked about, uh, even as he was proposing a budget or was going to propose a budget which should have substantial cuts in non-defense discretionary spending, he came out in front of a large audience to, to make the point that the non-defense discretionary budget is 12 percent of our overall budget. And there is no way to get from here to there responsibly in terms of uh, restoring our uh, fiscal sanity, you might say, if you don't address the bigger issues. He is committed to doing that. Um, and he welcomes uh, the uh, input that other uh, uh, leaders in Washington are providing in that process. So 
Uh, and he, as I think I said from here on Monday, uh, welcomes the statement by the Speaker of the House in the Wall Street Journal on Friday uh, that dealing with our, those bigger issues that affect our long-term debt, entitlement spending, uh, uh, interest, defense, as well as uh, tax expenditures, um, that we all need to link arms and do it together. Right, at some point. But yesterday, several leading Senate Democrats say that these negotiations that we're talking about now for, for the CR need to be broadened to talk about things that are mandatory, uh, you know, and not just domestic non-defense discretionary. Well, so Marla, does he I think just, that is premature? I would just say that we, we welcome the input from, from, from members and, and look forward to getting to the point where we are talking about reaching a deal on a continuing resolution that funds the government through the fiscal year uh, so that we can move on uh, so to deal with first. the bigger issue. Well, look, I'm not making a dividing line, but I, I don't think that anyone thinks between now and March 18th we will resolve uh, entitlement reform, tax expenditures, uh, and, and all the other issues that go into it. We would go into a, a, a much bigger deal. But the elements that would go into a uh, fiscal year 2011 agreement, I, I don't want to negotiate from here. Fair. Uh, sorry. Um, Jay. Jay, is the president then, to follow up on more, is, is it waiting for the House Republicans to put forward <coughs> their broad budget before it would be prepared to enter into broader negotiations? Jackie, we are in a situation, uh, as we were last week, where the government shuts down on March 18th. I mean, we're not, you know, we need to resolve the issue on the table, which is uh, funding for fiscal year 2011. Uh, so uh, we're not waiting for anything to get to those talks. So we're eager to... to but for broader negotiations, would you like to see? He's put out his budget. So I think you're asking me a version of what Mara said, which is when, you know, and I'm not, I'm not from here just, you know, separating the near term from the short term, except that we don't have a choice but to deal with the near term uh, funding uh, posed by, uh, you know, the short term extension. And, go ahead. And well, in that near, to, before you get to that near point, how, how worried are you that you'll be up against the President's departure to South America? Uh, we believe, uh, and that's also the beginning of a congressional research, uh, recess, rather, I think. So we believe that uh, we have uh, made clear, the President has made clear that uh, it is uh, an economic, uh, it would be incredibly harmful to the economy if we were to have a shutdown of the government. He doesn't want one. Congressional leaders don't want one. They have said so, both parties, that we believe that we can uh, work at a deal that avoids one, as, as we did last week. But, but obviously we think, as I've said, and I'll say one more time, uh, it would not be good for the economy. It would cre create uh, uh, a great deal of uncertainty if we were to, to continue this exercise, repeat this exercise every two weeks. And you just are? Briefly, the the, the uh, Congressional Budget Office scoring of your proposal from last week, they, they, they don't see $2 billion worth of savings if you separate well, We support the Democratic proposal that was put forward. It wasn't our proposal, but it was the Senate Democratic proposal. Uh, we have come halfway, we, the White House and, and the Democrats, with separate, slightly separate proposals. I, you know, they don't match up dollar for dollar in the cuts. Uh, the point is, the Senate proposal will be voted on today. The Senate Democratic proposal will be voted on today. After the outcome of that vote, we will then uh, receive, I think, a clear indication of the kind of, uh, you know, where we need to go. The President's made clear he's willing to do more. It is, I think, uh, essential and incumbent upon uh, the Republicans to show that they're willing to move, as we have, as the Democrats have. But because that's what the American people expect. They don't expect uh, in, a, in a negotiation or a compromise or the finding of common ground uh, that uh, they expect both sides to give, both sides to make tough choices, to come together, to do the business the people sent us here to do. But on the numbers, they, you said that's a difference between the Senate proposal and your proposal. Well, that's what explains the I, I'm just saying that the, because you described it as our proposal, and I just wanted to make clear that, first of all, we have never formally laid out, I mean, we, you know, we, we, we made clear that we uh, had indicated additional cuts that, that uh, we supported or could, could live with that would, uh, another six and a half 
billion dollars in cuts. The Senate, because the Senate's a uh, uh, a sovereign organization, um, you know, uh, it, uh, it, it, it the Senate Democrats produced their own budget that didn't. I, I'm just saying line for line, it didn't mirror necessarily the same cuts. We support it. We we want the Senate to vote on it, uh, and then we will proceed from there. Um, let me just uh, move around here. I haven't been. Yes, third row. Sorry. Uh, Jay, yes. two, two, two questions, questions. please. Um, for her, first of all, uh, the fact that Gary Locke is Chinese American, does the president believe this will make him more effective as an ambassador to China? Well, I, look, the president had an announcement today where he spoke. I, I, uh, his words are uh, far more important than mine on this issue. He obviously thinks. Secretary Locke will be an excellent ambassador. There, you know, it's, it's, there are a lot of very important ambassadorial posts ar around the globe, and this is top shelf, as you might say. So uh, his background, his range of experiences, his, uh, uh, what he brings to this job uh, make him ideally suited to fill it. So that matters more than the fact that he's Chinese-American, or that doesn't matter at all? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rank it. Obviously, the fact I mean, that he's Chinese-American doesn't matter. Secretary Locke spoke about how it matters to him, and it obviously matters to us that, that uh, he brings um, brings that as part of who he is to the to the to the job. Okay, and if I could just ask you on Guantanamo, does the president believe that Americans want that detention center closed, and does he have any hope for the possibility that it can still happen uh, during his term? Uh, the president didn't make his position based on polling, if that's what you're asking. What he firmly believes is that it is in America's interest, in our national security interest, as mili many military leaders have said, and as I would remind you the previous administra administration said at, towards its end, uh, that we should close the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. I and mean, that remains his position. And, and based on the logic that he explained at the time, um, I wonder if you think or he thinks that uh, simply declaring that he wanted it closed and that he still wants it closed achieves part of the goal. Our position is well known uh, in the United States and around the globe. And again, it is a position that's not ours alone or his alone. It's shared by uh, military leaders uh, and uh, was expressed by the previous administration. There are obviously obstacles to that. We, we understand the reality uh, that we're uh, living in and, and that this is a difficult issue, but it remains his goal. He remains committed to seeing that facility closed in, in the interests of uh, America's national security. Glenn. Uh, Jay, one of the members of uh, that sovereign uh, organization, the Senate, uh, Chuck Schumer, who the President presumably see today, uh, has proposed uh, putting uh, entitlements on the table mm -hmm. as well as certain uh, tax, uh, tax hikes. Uh, how does the president feel about that? And a second question from another sovereign. Uh, another sovereign, uh, Dick Luger yesterday said that he felt uh, the United States could not afford, uh, in a fiscal sense, any intervention in, in Libya. Uh, let me go to your question uh, about uh, Senator Schumer, and I, I would just say what I said tomorrow, which is we welcome the thoughtful input of lawmakers uh, on this issue. It, it is Im vitally important that we all recognize what the President made clear in his State of the Union, which you cannot get your fiscal house in order if you only go after 12 percent of the budget. And, and that's what non-defense discretionary spending amounts to. So uh, the more people who recognize the seriousness of this and, and the kind of steps that have to be taken, uh, the better. because. As he's made clear, we, we have to do this together. We have to get in the boat together and row in the same direction uh, with everyone sitting down and not standing up so the boat doesn't tip over. Uh, and, and he remains committed to that goal. On the, uh, sorry, what was your second question, Glenn? Yes, Senator Lucas said one of the factors we should consider in Libya is, is the cost. He said we can't afford it. I, I think that we consider all the factors, all the elements. And one of the things I got at, I think, yesterday on the plane and, and the day before from here and others have is that uh, Secretary Gates, is that what's important when we consider these options that have uh, memorable phrases attached to them, like no-fly zone, is that these are uh, substantial uh, undertakings that require uh, assets and, 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 and potentially put Americans and, and our uh, 
uh, the forces of our international partners in harm's way, and, and obviously they also cost money. So all these factors are things that we consider uh, as we develop a, a, a set of options and, and potentially pursue one or the other. April. Jay, I want to go back to AFRICOM. How often does the President talk to the commanders of AFRICOM? How often did he talk to uh, Kip Ward, who is now former commander mm -hmm. there, and you have uh, Carter Ham now? Uh, April, I have to I have to take that. I mean, defense might know. Obviously, there's a chain of command. He doesn't, uh, as as far as I know, have regular uh, scheduled uh, contacts with uh, different uh, uh, you know regional commanders. But uh, beyond that, I, I I'm not sure. Well, I'd have to I could find out for you, but I'm well, not especially sure. Especially right now, AFRICOM is very important because administration sources are saying that this, if indeed there were to be some way to, to enforce the no-fly zone and to, to deal with military options, the U.S. African Command Center would be the lead. Mm -hmm. So with that, do you know anything of how the President is communicating? How is he getting information from, from, from AFRICOM? And also, not only just with Libya, there are other issues with Cote d'Ivoire. There, right. there are other issues within Africa. Is the President being apprised of what's happening? Well, absolutely, he's being apprised of what's happening multiple times a day in terms of Libya and the whole region, uh, uh, as well as Cote d'Ivoire. The AFRICOM is it's not an independent entity. It's, a, it's, it's, it's part of the, the, the military command structure. And, and uh, he, he speaks with his defense secretary and his commanders regularly. Uh, but I don't, uh, uh, I don't have any information on you in terms of his specific communications with uh, one command. And there's a follow-up. Is there a somewhat of a, 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 a study or some type of assessment on the psychological costs on the soldiers to, to, to go into combat again, the possibility to do more combat. I, I'd have to refer you to the Defense Department. I don't know. Margaret? Thanks. Um, forgive me if this came up Monday. I, I might just be spacing on it. Um, in, when Dennis McDonough spoke on Sunday, he made a reference to uh, the fact that a the administration's approach to d domestic radicalization would be forthcoming within the coming weeks. And I'm just wondering if you know what he was talking about. Are you guys getting ready to unveil some something new? Or, what, or I, I just didn't know, what, do you know anything more about that? Should we expect? Well, I don't want to get ahead of what Mr. <laughs> McDonough said. So I, I, I think that we have uh, made clear that we take this issue um, very seriously. We think it's an important issue. We have been. Uh, engaging in it or evaluating it for some time. And, and one of the reasons I think that, because uh, people had talked about the timing of Mr. McDonough's speech, uh, the, the, the timing was associated with where we are in the process of, uh, of that review of the situation, which we think is very, uh, is an important one. And, and that's why he spoke. So I don't have any more for you on what specifically he was referring to that but I can announce for you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the administration already has a policy. Nothing that I can, policy. Policy. That I can announce. Okay, thanks. Yes. Since you spoke to us on Monday, has the U.S. government been able to reach any clarity about the, the makeup and the aspirations of the various uh, Libyan opposition factions? Well, I, I, not, I can't say more than I said, which is that we are in uh, contact with uh, opposition groups, individuals and groups, uh, through various channels, and, uh, and that's ongoing. Uh, yes, ma'am. On the, the King um, hearing, Mm -hmm. I know we heard from McDonough, and I know that the the feeling is that there there's no there's still outreach to the Muslim community, but they are <coughs> for, for whatever reason they're feeling demonized, and there there is this guilt by association, whether the administration is is uh, vouching for it or not. Are we going to hear from the president for this? Obviously, Muslim engagement is something that the president has been working on throughout this administration. Well, he has, and I would say that uh, the fact that. Mr. McDonough went out uh, and gave this speech uh, when he did, where he did, is, uh, you know, reinforces the message that he carried, which is that it is, it is our belief, this administration's belief, that, uh, A, as I said, in the United States of America, we do not practice guilt by association, and B, uh, that in fact, in uh, dealing with this issue, Muslim Americans are very much a part of the solution and not the problem. And that uh, that is our position, and, and obviously, you know, Congressman King should should answer for himself. For yes, Dave. Sorry, can we? But will we hear from the president? I, I don't have an announcement on on when he might speak uh, 
next. Okay. Well, well, thanks, Jay. Um, a few minutes ago, Speaker Boehner put out a tweet saying, this is it in its entirety, Americans have one message for their elected leaders, cut spending now. What's the White House response to that? Do you think that's where the political debate now is? One I think message in the 140 money? characters allowed in a tweet, there is room to add. And I would say that Americans want spending cut, and they want uh, responsible government, and they do not want actions taken in Washington that would undermine the recovery that we have fought so hard uh, to achieve, and that we are in the process of, of seeing, that, that including the substantial private sector job growth that we saw last Friday. So uh, that's more than 140 characters. Yeah. But if you put it into one of those condensers. <laughs> uh, that's cheating, but nevertheless. Um, okay. Do, do you think, but do you Americans think want us to responsibly cut spending not and, not, and not tank the economy. Okay. But do you think the debate is such that the emphasis has become unduly put on the cutting part of that equation? I think that, the, more importantly, the President thinks that cutting spending is important, and he made that clear. There is no disagreement here in Washington or around the country that we need to reduce our spending to, to deal with our deficits. And I would remind you again that the President's budget that he put forward does two things. It cuts spending and it reduces the deficit, which is a challenge that not every plan that we have heard, uh, specific or otherwise, can meet. So his commitment is clear. His commitment to work with Republicans and Democrats to find common ground is clear. And, and, and we are engaged in that process now. He is optimistic that we can find that common ground. Can we follow Let me uh, move around some folks that I haven't. Yes, Jerry. Jay, uh, two, two questions. On the, uh, the meeting with the Democratic leaders, is, you said they're trying to reach common ground. Are they trying to reach common ground among Democrats or um, a common ground with something that's palatable to the Republicans in the House and Senate? Yeah, the, my reference to common ground was uh, everybody, Republicans, Democrats, coming together for a final resolution of, of this issue of funding the government through the end of the fiscal year. Uh, this meeting is part of that process. And then on, on Libya, Jay, uh, the, with, with Guantanamo Bay, the executive order earlier in the week, and with the Congressman King's hearings, is there any, is this making the, the delicate line the White House is trying to make in Libya more difficult? Are these two domestic decisions making the president's work more difficult internationally? No. Yes. I'm so sure about the ways that side the Japanese paper. Two questions. On Libya, you have been communicating with European allies, but do you have any plans to communicate with your Asian allies such as Japan in light of the in light of G8 foreign ministers meeting in Paris? And secondly, on Okinawa, Japan, where the US base is located, there was a comment by senior U.S. State Department official of Okinawa made to a U.S. student saying that mm -hmm. the people in Okinawa are lazy, or et cetera. What, what the I'm, I'm not aware of that comment, so I'd have to refer you to the State Department. And in terms of the spectrum of communications we're having uh, on, on Libya, uh, I might also ask you to, to either check back, back with us, uh, the national security staff, or with the State Department. Let me go all the way back. Yes, in the back, Thank final you. row, striped shirt. Thank you, Jay. Um, on the no-fly zone, the big push seems to be coming from Britain and France. Uh, in this situation, is you've, you've sort of articulated that you're willing to wait to get this right. Is the administration, is it fair to characterize that you're trying to be the cooler head? Or is there a concern that other nations are too quick to overcommit NATO resources, which are mostly U.S. resources? No. The, the, we are working with our international partners, the British and the French, and we are uh, moving together uh, together. And, and the, the leadership the United States has shown has is, is been quite clear, as I, as I, as I think I pointed out, and, and I think I reminded you at the beginning, or relatively close to the beginning, that it was the United States that initiated the meetings at the NAC, at NATO in Brussels, uh, where a lot of these military options uh, have been uh, under consideration. So uh, we are coordinating with our international partners, uh, and that includes obviously the British and the French. Uh, yes? Um, yeah, uh, one question. Uh, I have two questions. One, 
Mm-hmm. On, on public broadcast. Mm-hmm. Um, with, uh, fr- from an alternative perspective, I mean, could the case be made that since uh, that there's only 2% of the funding comes from the federal government, uh, that it could be a long-term benefit for public broadcasting that cut the purse strings from political pressure? I, I would just refer you to my statement before. Okay, uh, second question. Uh, there's been some conflicting reports on where the White House stands with regards to Dr. Berwick at CMS. Um, is the White House still committed to seeing that through to a confirmation? You know, I confess that I'll have to take that question. I don't have anything, which is not meant to connote anything except that I, I, I don't know. So uh, I, I, I'll let me take that question. We'll get back to you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Why is uh, tax cuts so much of a mantra uh, when it didn't create jobs over the last decade and 40% of the stimulus was tax cuts? And um, do you agree with Senator Reid's news conference yesterday that oil subsidies and farm subsidies could be alternative ways to cut the budget? And thirdly, is Social Security off the table now that people are starting to realize that not a dime of the deficit comes from Social Security and it's fully paid for 30 years? Uh, what I'll, that's a lot of questions, but the, uh, uh, we believe that the tax cuts that this president has uh, proposed and supported and signed into law have had a very positive impact on the economy. The, the ones that were included in the uh, Recovery Act helped us uh, get out of a situation where this economy was experiencing dramatic negative uh, growth. It was shrinking, uh, where job loss was as high as 740 or 50,000 a month, uh, to a situation now where we have uh, real economic growth and real job growth, and have had for a sustained period of time. Uh, and we think that uh, the, the payroll tax holiday, the payroll tax cut that every American uh, received as a result of the tax cut deal, the bipartisan tax cut deal that was reached in December, which the President signed, uh, has had a, a a salutary effect on, on, on growth uh, in, in, in this quarter. So uh, we think they are part of the package. And I would remind you that this president has, has uh, passed uh, something on the order of 14 or 17 small business tax cuts. So uh, they are part of the puzzle. When you talk about the broader, it, it is true that the, as I think our budget director has said, that Social Security is not uh, the problem when it comes to our near-term deficits, our annual deficits. It is, however, an issue in terms of its long-term solvency and health, and this is a vital program uh, that we intend to uh, make stronger as we address the overall uh, issue of entitlement reform. Yes? Jay, you, um, back on Libya for a second, you keep mentioning NATO. Is intervention in Libya something that can be sold as the purview of NATO, and is that a strong line of possible action you're let me, pursuing? Let me, just, let me just back up here and make clear that we, first of all, we are not at a decision point. We are considering these options. We are actively considering a no-fly zone. We are very committed to pursuing a process by which the options that we do uh, decide on are that we work with our international partners to take them and implement them. Uh, beyond that, I mean, distinctions between uh, NATO is obviously a military alliance, and that is a, a fit place for discussing the military options that we have. It is also vital, we believe, very important to the whole uh, way that we deal with the unrest in the region that, that the international community broadly is part of this, that it is not uh, just the West, it is not just the United States. And it has not been, and that has been a great virtue. And that's a virtue that we hope uh, to continue. Okay, last one. China. Yes, sir. Uh, with the upcoming uh, anniversary of the oil spill last summer, I wonder, is the President satisfied with the current level of new regulation over the oil industry and the level of preparedness for another potential incident like we saw last year? Well, I would just refer you to the, I forget who asked the question about uh, drilling that we take very seriously the need to have the regulations in place that will help prevent the kind of environmental uh, disaster that we had because of the deep water spill, uh, that the containment facilities are adequate. Uh, and that is why uh, those uh, companies that 
have sought leases for deep water drilling have had to prove that they have that capacity. And we, as I mentioned, uh, approved uh, our, the first lease since that uh, process, uh, those regulations were implemented last week. We are, we are very much interested in responsible uh, but effective uh, oil explora exploration and, and, and recovery. And, and that is why we have approved 37 shallow water permits and why overall, as I noted, uh, domestic oil production is at its highest, last year was at its highest level since 2003. That's it for me, folks. Thanks very much.